We are back at Velocity 2011, and I'm joined now by Adam Jacob, Chief Product Officer of OpsCode. We're going to talk a little bit about building software from the ground up. Thanks for being with us. So speaking of building software from the ground up, yeah, you, yeah. You, bought, you, you built Shuff from the ground up, right? I did, yeah. And how did you decide that you needed to do that? Sure. So, I mean, uh, there's, there's a couple of things, right? So one, uh, I was running a consulting company, and what we did was um, build fully automated infrastructure for startups. So uh, I've come to Velocity uh, for the last four years, and I started out because I was running this consulting company, and what we did was you could basically pay us a flat fee, mm -hmm. um, and we would learn about your infrastructure, and then we would just build you one bespoke, right? Um, and we owned the rights to the technology we used to build it, so we could iterate really quickly. So in like two years, we built 12 different startups. Wow. Um, uh, and soup to nuts, fully automated, right? From, sure. from you know, provisioning all the way through to like app deployment, monitoring and trending, everything fully automated. Um, had some pretty good success, fairly large companies that had, you know, they were running you know, maybe four or 500 servers, uh, no systems administrators, just software developers, right? Um, what we learned was the tools that we were using in order to actually configure those systems and to kind of build fully automated infrastructure, which really is a systems integration problem, mm -hmm. right? So configuration management you tends to think about the world in terms of singular systems, right? Sure. But actual running infrastructure is this huge nested web of all these interconnected applications. And so it's, it's this systems integration problem. And so all these tools were really built around having more of a silo for themselves mm -hmm. and really not letting you be able to abstract enough about the data that informs a pattern mm -hmm. from how the pattern gets applied, right? Right. So like, you know, if you think about the analogy of like uh, making like sewing, right? If you like you buy a dress pattern mm -hmm. and then you buy fabric to melt to build the dress, you don't have a different pattern for every possible uh, right? Sure, sure. Um, right. for every possible fabric. As far as so, I know. So yes. yeah, you don't. Right. <laughs> um, not that I'm a big sewer, but like I, that much I know, right? And like you wind up in this uh, so so I wrote Chef because for my consulting company if we were ever going to actually scale better than just you know me being smart and getting yeah. faster at it, yeah. um, we had to have tools that would let us separate that data from the pattern in a way that was reusable and that would let us deal with that like five percent of people's companies that was really unique and different. Sure, right. Um, not and going into the problem knowing that like we don't know what we'll find, right? Like there's so much new technology, there's so much weird stuff that happens, and startups use all that stuff. Yeah. So like the only way we could possibly do it was to write a tool that was kind of custom fit to the fact that we didn't know what the world looked like and gave us the flexibility sure. we had to have in order to be able to build a consulting company. And out of that kind of came Chef and OpsCode because we did a really good job of doing it. Yeah. Like we sort of stumbled on the same sort of things that, that our CTO, Chris Brown, found building EC2, which was you need to build these really small network primitives that have behavior and store data, but that really are just fundamental little building blocks. And then mm -hmm. you build that on top of each other over time, right? So. The simplest stuff is usually dreadfully complicated. Sure. Um, sure. And, and the reason that you get that simplicity out the other end is that it was built in these tiny little blocks that just kind of accrete up over time until something is so simple that you don't even realize how complicated it is. So, so, so building from the ground up, is that what it has allowed? It's allowed that flexibility and to incorporate the unknown? Yeah. So I mean, there's, there's two things, right? Any, anybody, uh, I have an analogy about open source uh, and, and people who do it, which is we're kind of like guys who work on, uh, on, on classic cars, right? If you go to like a car show, there's dudes who, you know, will all flock around and talk about how cool each other's cars are. Sure. But they don't take those cars home with them usually, right? Right. They, they don't Not usually, usually. Yeah. classic car guys don't buy other perfect mint condition classic cars. They buy rusted out junkers, mm -hmm. right? And then they get all their friends over and they drink beer and they like fix up the car. Sure. Um, and so when you build something from scratch, part of the reason you do it is because the thing you want isn't the same as some other dude's car, right? So like you know, working on somebody else's project or doing the sorts of things, if what you want to change is fundamental, mm -hmm. you either have to have an argument that convinces somebody that you know better than they do how to like cut out, how to, you know, build that classic car. Sure. Um, or you could just go get your own car, right? right. And like do right. it yourself. So, yeah. you know, building it from the ground up, it's a choice about, <clears throat> about fitting more to your own problem space. Um, and it's a choice about understanding more for yourself, kind of how you want it to be built. And then on, on some level, it's also just, that need as an individual contributor and as somebody who wants to build something new mm. to like not be constrained by the things that came before, just to sure. be informed by them, right? Right. So it's why there's such a proliferation in open source and that's why it's so healthy and vibrant, right? Is that, you know, open source projects start that way, yeah. you know, with the, with the equivalent of dudes in a garage. Sure. Uh, and then they grow um, from that sometimes into, you know, like Chef, which has, 
you know, 360 individual contributors and right. 70 corporate contributors. And right, it's this massive accretion of people and this <laughs> massive community that's built up about it. But like that happened because it started out with us like essentially drinking beer and being like, no, I really want it to look this way. And then other people saw the car and they're like, oh, well, I could, no, it'd be sure. cool. Like I could help you polish the tire and like I'll come over and like refurbish the engine. And like what you pop out the other side is this really amazing thing that all these people are invested in. Sure. So, you know, sometimes building it from the ground up, usually, you know, for all of, for all the technical reasons people choose to do stuff and all the other things, psychologically, it's usually just, I want to build it. Like I right. have a vision in my head and like if, if, if that vision gets interrupted, you're done. And sure. so part of that desire is to like have the freedom to steward your own vision into being. Right. And beer. And beer. And beer. And beer never hurts anybody, right? <laughs> sure. If you want your friends to come over, it helps to give them beer. It's, yeah. And that's... then they'll help you work on your car. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do uh, system administrators use Chef differently than software developers? Um, you know, not really. Like the... The difference is an approach, right? So the thing systems administrators know and do that, that a lot of software developers don't, not all software developers, right? Like there's a spectrum uh, of skill set and at the top they look very similar, right? Yeah. If you look at like Theo Schlossnagel, who I think is the best systems administrator on the planet, and you look at Chris Brown, who's mm -hmm. in my opinion one of the best engineers on the planet, they look very similar. Right. Their paths to get there are very different, right? right. right. Um, but you know, when you get to the top of that pyramid, they're very much the same, right? Um, and so I, I think when you look at how they that informs the use of a tool like Chef. The reality is systems administrators know more how the systems already behave. So right. it's easy for them to write code that describes how the systems behave. Um, with software developers, they know less about how the operating systems behave, right? And so they rely a little more on sort of the pre-canned stuff that you can do. So Chef has you know, 250 existing recipes for technology. They just mm -hmm. kind of download them and start from those patterns, right? Sure. Um, where the software developers have a little leg up on systems administrators is they're usually much more prone to integrate it more deeply in the application, right? Because they're the ones who know more exactly how the application is behaving. Mm -hmm. And so that tying that in under the hood is usually a place where they kind of have a leg up from the traditional sysadmin. But when it comes out the other side, like you know, when you pull out the lever of time, it really looks basically the same, whether it was built by a sysadmin right. or a software developer, because you know, if you come in from the application side, you kind of march your way up to understanding the operating system. If you yeah. come in from the operating system side, you kind of march your way up to understanding the app, and at the end, it pops out basically right down. Right, you get where you need to be. Yeah. So shifting gears a little bit, is automated infrastructure only applicable to large companies, or does it have a, a universal appeal? I think it has a universal appeal. I, the thing you need to have in order for it to be truly universal, right? So like. The, that classic like uh, long tail, right? Sure. So you've got like the enterprise at the head, mm -hmm. and then you've got everybody else, right? It decreasing right. in size over time. So long tail is long, right? <laughs> um, and <laughs> right. and usually what happens in the long tail is you find people who, much like guys in garages, they they have more time than they have money. Yes. Um, right. And so so you know when you talk about infrastructure automation, they automate because they like it because it's fun, because mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting. Like there's a whole list of reasons why you do it when you're small. Um, the other reason you do it if you're a startup is because no one starts a startup and is like, ah, oh, we're just going to be mediocre. <laughs> we're going to land in mediocrity, sure. right? Like sure. everybody, like, you know, ev the plan is always to be huge and enormous. Right. And it's way easier to automate early than to automate late, right? Sure. So like orders of magnitude easier. It costs way less money. There's no politics. Yeah. Um, you can scale faster, you're, you can be more conservative on cash, right? So like everything about doing it early is good. Yeah, retrofitting um, is kind of a dirty oh my God, word, right? right? Well, it's not dirty, but it's hard. Yeah. Right? Um, it just sucks. <laughs> sure. Like it's just, it takes a long time to do. Right. So uh, you really want to get that stuff nailed down um, early. Uh, if you're large companies, the drivers are a little different, although the psychographic is similar. Like they both kind of want to rip shit up and do it differently. Yeah. Sorry. That's right, um, it's live, live TV. Yeah, it's what are you going to do, right? Um, <laughs> I don't want to turn into like Howard Stern or something on accident. <laughs> but like you uh, you wind up with this moment where, you know, everybody understands, even in large companies you find people who they look at the way they're managing their infrastructure. They look at, you know, it doesn't take very long when you see like an EC2 node spin up or you see a Rackspace yeah. cloud node spin up and it takes you a couple of minutes to have infrastructure running. Mm -hmm to realize that the four weeks or eight weeks it takes you to get a VM running inside of your corporation is totally ridiculous. Right. Um, and in order to solve that problem, you have to automate it away because all of the compliance and security and audit rules are built up around that specific way you do it, right? The tooling has leaked into the compliance regime mm -hmm. um, in a way that means you have to automate it in order to get that compression of time down. Because even if you could like deploy an internal cloud or whatever, sure, sure. who cares, right? If it takes you five minutes to do it and it takes you eight weeks to get it configured, right. still, it's nobody not, loves yeah, you. Right. Um, <laughs> and 
and, and that's what you want, right? Like you want people to care and be like, oh my God, this totally changed my life. Well, it's yeah. not very life changing if right. it takes you know, a sysadmin eight weeks to deliver it to you. Right. So, so the motivation's a little different. On the, on the low end, it's kind of fear and being like, we're gonna be Facebook someday yeah. and there's no way we can be Facebook without automation. Uh, also, you have limited resources, so you just got to be able to kick it out because mm -hmm. you got three guys and you're scrappy. Yep. In the large organization, it's we have all this organizational inefficiency. We know that our competitors are going to figure out how to do this stuff. If they do it before we do, then our ability to innovate is seriously hampered because I've got this fleet of guys who aren't working on my problem. They're instead working on my infrastructure, whereas my competitor did that faster than I did, which yep. means they take that same human resources, which are incredibly scarce, right? It's hard to find good talent. So you don't want to waste that talent doing stuff that, your other, that the other guys have automated. So like, you know, the forces are a little different, but the importance remains the same. So how are infrastructure and application management converging? Yeah, well, uh, the simplest story is this one, right? So let's say, to use that analogy I was just using about like provision timing, um, I guess not an analogy, yeah. the, the fact <laughs> of it, right? Um, <clears throat> if you need to spin a new system up and have it just start working, that's actually the goal. So you want to go from nothing at all yeah. to totally working and integrated into your infrastructure and your application with one motion, right? One statement, do make this system work, yeah. right? <laughs> right? So if yeah. you have a separate application deployment step, by definition, it's two steps, right? Get it ready for the app, yeah. deploy the app, right? Two steps, not one step. That sucks a little. Um, now, it doesn't suck for a while. Right? So like in the grand pantheon of things that suck in your infrastructure, you have to fix a lot of things sure. before you're like, man, that second step really bothers me. Yeah, right, <laughs> right? Right. Um, but, but you do get there, right? Um, every time you solve a problem, you just, you know, it's like peeling an onion, right? You just get to another layer of problem. There, when you build enough automation, you do get to a place where you're like, man, it's really irritating that they don't just come up and join the cluster. They don't just automatically get added to load balancers. They don't just automatically discover sure. their databases. They don't automatically do all of that stuff. So. The idea that you that that application deployment is the separate step that line is absolutely getting blurred, hmm. and the reason is that at at once you start really doing full automation, it becomes clear that it doesn't need to be. Hmm. Um, and one of the there's a couple of ways that that gets mitigated. That's a little uh, that, that people don't do quite a lot yet, right? So one is on the web. Uh, it's this idea of dark launching features. So when you deploy new code, rather than writing your code so that all it does is uh, is as soon as it goes out, all the new features are available. You actually deploy the code, but nobody gets that path yet. And okay. then there's a switch you flip that turns that code path on, either sure. for some subset of customers or for everyone, mm -hmm. which means that you can totally separate out most of the reasons for like a rolling restart or like a gates and phases lockstep application deploy. Mm -hmm. You can skip that step because it's now safe to push that new code out because nobody's seen it, sure. right? right? So usually the reason you do that like kind of lockstep gates and phases at application deploy is because you want that new feature to come available to everybody right, right? right, right. now. And you control that with that gates and phases marching forward in lockstep of infrastructure deployment. Whereas you could just control that in the app mm -hmm. and have it be a, a feature flag that you throw and all of a sudden, you can have that thousands of nodes who just deploy themselves. That's cool. Right? And you just kind of yeah. keep track of it. And you're like, OK, it looks like that code's rolled out to everybody. Yeah. So now we'll flip the feature flag, and now it's turned on. Right? Gotcha. Um, so yeah. that risk was gone. The restart, like they restart as they restart. You mm -hmm. don't have to worry about you know, doing A, B cutovers. Right? But in order to get that, you have to have that in your application, sure. which a lot of people don't. Yeah. So you know, over time, that's going to become more and more common, because you know, uh, Mark Burgess who's one of my heroes, uh, uh, is kind of talks about that as having, you know, trying not to make promises you can't keep, right? Sure. So you can make promises about yourself. So as an individual server can make the promise that I will have an application deployed at a particular revision. Mm -hmm. But he can't necessarily make a promise that my neighbors will too. Right. Right? So right. by having those feature flags, you kind of enable everybody to keep promises in the right way, which is I, as the application developer, can promise that once that feature is fully deployed and I flip the switch, that it's going to work. But you can't promise me necessarily that they'll all get deployed at the same moment. Sure, right, right. So last question from you. From an infrastructure standpoint, do hardware specs even matter anymore? Hardware specs totally matter, yeah. right? So the only people who would argue, I think, that hardware specs don't matter are people trying to sell the fact that, yeah. that hardware specs don't matter. So like, <laughs> um, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the easy answer would be like, look at what happens with an SSD. Mm -hmm. So you build an application, and uh, your database is the bottleneck because everything you know you got this giant monstrosity of consistency there in, in the nut, yeah. where everybody wants to like have to make sure that data is instantly available everywhere. 
So you've got a write problem, right? Even reads might be troublesome. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, hardware specs matter, sure. right? If you are running that traditional database in EC2, like it's only going to go as fast as EBS lets you go, right? right? If you could just pop some SSDs in there, you sure. know, problem right. solved, right. right? Now it's not solved forever. Like you still have a fundamental architectural problem that may or may not get solved over time, mm -hmm. depending on how you grow. But right, I mean, it probably is good enough for now. Sure. Um, similarly, like. You know, when you look at what we've done with like traditional high high availability mm -hmm. over a long time, you know that stuff happened because you had some control over the hardware. You could say, I have a crossover cable that I plug in from this server to this server, and maybe it even spans physical racks or whatever. Mm -hmm. But they have this dedicated connection. There's no other piece of equipment between them. I can do heartbeat. I can do failover. I can do you know remote disk replication. I can do all this stuff, right? And that requires this understanding of physical infrastructure. So, sure. you know, the cloud is is awesome and you can build really great applications for it. Um, there are lots of applications in the world that it, that could be moved to the cloud but require some re-architecture. There's right. a lot of applications running in the cloud right now that are horribly right. inefficient because if they could have control over the hardware, right, they would run in a much smaller footprint, they'd probably be faster, they'd be easier to manage, but you can't because of the constraints of the environment. So sure. hardware specs totally matter, um, and the idea that they don't is, uh, is a little specious. Excellent, well thank you so much for being with us. Appreciate yeah. it. Thanks. We'll be back soon with more live interviews from Velocity 2011. Please stay with us.